All righty, so we're going to be uh, getting here started here in a second. Um, I see attendees uh, starting to come in. Uh, welcome to the webinar today. Um, and we're going to be talking about it's not just a pipeline that is at risk when it comes to cyber attacks. It's also your family and your home. And we're going to be talking to Hayden Kopser about the cybersecurity insurance that you need for your home and family. We'll get here uh, started here in about one minute. All righty, let's get started here. Uh, thanks, every, thank you to everyone that is joining and has joined. Um, it is not just a pipeline. It's individuals that are at risk too of ransomware and cyber attacks. And we're gonna be talking today about how your home and family also need cybersecurity insurance. And some of the things that, you know, when, I, when this was brought to my attention, I wasn't even aware of it. And I didn't know it was even a thing. And I was like, wow, I was like, I've got to have Hayden on this call to talk about this. So I want to introduce myself. If you're not, uh, not familiar who I am, I'm Will Nobles. I'm the founder and CEO of Vector Choice. Uh, today I have uh, Hayden Kopser, the president of North Improvement. Um, and he will, he's going to be talking today about insurance and why you need cyber insurance when it comes to your home and family. So a little bit uh, about me. I'm, it's better than uh, this, uh, uh, say it, than I, me saying it. So I'm going to play this real quick for you. With over 20 years experience in the technology field, serving Fortune 500 and small companies alike, he holds two degrees and multiple certifications. Cybersecurity expert, Will Nobles. Boy, has he had success in his life. Since I've started my company, I've dedicated myself in helping my clients protect the integrity of their data. The CEO of Vector Choice Technology Solutions, please welcome Mr. Will Nobles. People don't get the risk that's out there. Don't be careless with your technology. Your employees are your number one security risk that you have. So when it clicks on the link, it spreads across the network and encrypts the data on that network. When we're sitting down with a client for the first time, one of the things we're looking at is what are they doing today to protect yourself against cyber attacks? Just because you're a small firm or you don't have a lot of money, don't think that someone's not trying to hack you. Everybody is vulnerable. We can do dark, go into the dark web, look and see of your employees um, what passwords are out there. What we do is partner humanity with technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and... All righty, so that's a little bit about me and what I do. Um, yes, I do a lot of TV and uh, speaking appearances about cybersecurity, and I want to give back to the community and to my clients and, um, and just members of the community out there about how to protect yourself against cyber attacks. And we're doing webinars every month about different topics. Today, we're talking uh, with Hayden about home and insurance and cybersecurity insurance for your home and family. But a little bit about Vector Choice. Um, we have been very blessed to be very lucky over the past few years of our growth and success in our company. And, um, and we, uh, we're continuing growing and we're continuing doing things. We do outsourced IT and managed services. We do VoIP hosting for our clients. And we do a lot of cybersecurity consulting and management for our clients, just educating people on how to protect themselves against cyber attacks. Now we have uh, uh, several offices across the country. We have five offices right now. We have we support clients in about 17 states, and uh, our corporate office is in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but we have offices up in D.C. and down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We do a lot of compliance from HIPAA, PCI, ITAR, SOX, GDPR, and guys. One of the things about compliance today. Even Texas just last week passed a, a compliancy to do business in the state of Texas. So California, Texas, Ohio, New York are just a few of the states that have already passed local state. If you're doing business within those states, if it's a, another company or an individual, you have to meet those requirements that they require in those states, no matter what state that you're in. Just like GDPR, GDPR is an EU-based um, um, compliancy. But if you have one contact in your system that is GDPR, um, that is from the EU, you have to meet GDPR compliancy. So please work with us. If you're not a client, if you are a client, please work with us on those types of things so you're familiar with what kind of compliances you need to do based on state, based on uh, country as well. So today I've got Hayden here. Hayden, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you share uh, your story, uh, uh, everyone, if you have any questions for me or Hayden during the time, 
please put in the Q&A in the chat. We will get to you. Um, this is not going to be a long, drawn out, boring web uh, um, um, PowerPoint. We want to answer those questions for you and give you the information on how to protect yourself uh, when it comes to your home and family. So Hayden, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Will, and, and hello to everyone. Thanks so much for listening in. As Will said, this is not going to be boring. This will be extremely informative, and you are going to walk away with knowledge that will be applicable to your life today. I guarantee you will learn something today that you are going to use going forward to better protect yourself, your family, your friends, your company, perhaps. Uh, so slight bit about my background. I've been in the high net worth insurance industry for many years. Uh, I worked at AIG within their private client group before starting my own firm. Uh, we still focus on insuring families at our firm like I did at AIG, but we offer a, a broader suite of, of coverage and we also work with commercial clients. And while I was at AIG, one of my specialties, because I have an app development background, I've put seven mobile apps on the Apple app stores, uh, was doing cyber insurance at AIG. So focusing on families. And when we were focusing on this back in 2017 or so, people didn't really know that they were so exposed. Everyone knows you can get a virus. Everyone knows you can get hacked and so forth, but they didn't realize how prevalent it was. And the prevalence of cyber threats have only grown as technology has expanded. So it's become a, a really distinct focus of mine because cyber attacks are infiltrating every aspect of our lives from purchasing a car to a work of art to playing around on social media. We are constantly at threat to, you can consider opening an email and we're gonna go through some of these scenarios and how you can spot a fraud before it happens because that's the best time to spot one. Um, and you'll notice even though I'm an insurance guy, the very last thing that we're going to touch on is the insurance side of it, because that's a stopgap. That is an after the fact way to remedy a situation. I don't want you to have to use insurance if you buy it. The goal is to avoid it um, and better protect you because no one wants to have a claim, no one wants to be hacked or be defrauded. So let's get into to the, the conversation today. As Will mentioned, uh, do not hesitate to put something into the chat. We can stop at any point to delve deeper if there's something that you uh, feel is not being answered and, you know, really here to be informative and, and collaborative with whoever wants to learn something. Okay, so modern cyber exposures are, as I mentioned, expanding constantly. Uh, it used to be when, when email first came around, your main cyber exposure at home was very minimal. Criminals weren't so sophisticated. They might spam your email. They might try and, and hit you with a virus on your computer, but that was more of a nuisance than it was a financial threat to you and your family or your business as well. Um, so what's changed over the last 20 or so years and, and really even over the last few years is there are more devices that are connected to the internet. You've probably seen the acronym IOT or heard people refer to the internet of things. So what is that really? It's, it's just devices that are internet compatible. So you think of right now, if you look around your home or your car, wherever you're listening to this, maybe your office, I want you to look right in front of you. At the very least, you're looking at either a smartphone or a computer monitor or a laptop. That at the very least is one internet connected device. If you look around, I look around my, my mobile phones, my personal business phones are not far away. Those connect to the internet. My television is a smart television now. Smart TVs are pretty prominent, um, even at the cheaper TV level. Everything's connecting to the internet. And that's great in some ways. You can get YouTube on your TV, but it's bad in, in the other way, which is that your internet, your Wi-Fi is now connecting to numerous devices that people can hack and use to get at you, your private information and your financial security. Um, another thing that's going on are there are more users. Uh, it used to be, and I remember growing up, we didn't all have smartphones. Kids didn't have all these electronic devices. Computer time was, was pretty, pretty well controlled. Nowadays, three-year-olds, two-year-olds have iPads they're playing around with. Uh, so there's more users on the devices in the home and there are more devices in the home. Uh, you also, when friends come over or if you have someone working on your home, for example, they wanna to connect to the Wi-Fi. These are things that you wanna allow them to do, but there are ways to do that securely. Um, poor cyber hygiene. Uh, I like this term cyber hygiene. We are all guilty of having poor cyber hygiene at some times. 
Uh, we have all visited a website that was unsecure, told us on the browser in the top left that it was not secure and still decided to browse around, still clicked links. We Many of us have probably clicked links and emails that we were not so sure um, were, were secure. Will, I'm sure, could speak to how often employees can lead to a company being shut down because they clicked a bad link and didn't really think to follow their, their cyber hygiene training. Absolutely. There's, uh, employees are your number one uh, security risk, uh, period. Uh, it's that human, unfortunately, that human interaction with technology um, collides together when you're talking about security. And it's funny that you're talking about, you know, just the different uh, devices at your house, you know, the ring, uh, the ring doorbells and the, the Nest thermostats. Uh, you know, I, I actually did a, um, a TV appearance uh, in Washington, D.C. about does your smart home think you're stupid? <laughs> and, yes, and yes, it does. Uh, um, you know, just just think about this. If you've got a smart stove and, and I hack in as a hacker and I turn your stove up and you're, you're gone for a week and it's at full blast, it's going to end up catching on fire. Right. And so I can burn down a house by just a hack. And people don't think about uh, putting, you know, all these smart devices putting in their homes. The risk that you, uh, you know, you, we, we all seen the, um, the YouTube on Facebook and social media where the, the child, uh, the guy started talking, it was a, a ring, uh, ring uh, camera um, mm -hmm. in a child's room and, and the guy hacked into it and was talking to the child. Um, that happens more than you'd imagine. And that's, and that's what we, we, we cannot forget from our home and family of how to properly protect yourself from those things. Absolutely, Will. Yeah, and, and you know, with smart homes, even your, even your uh, <laughs> sometimes even your refrigerator is internet connected. It'll tell you when you're running low on milk or eggs or whatever. It's cool, but again, it's a huge exposure. The stove is a terrifying one, you know, if you really want to hurt someone. It's not so hard to do it. Um, and we think this stuff is cool, and it is, but you really have to be cognizant of, of how you must protect it. And, and another item for cyber exposures, more and more financial transactions are happening online. And this was, this, this was the trend long before COVID hit. But in, once COVID hit, that's a whole different story. Um, even really traditional industries like the art world are doing massive auctions online, like tens of millions of dollars being transacted online. These are areas where people are buying cars, buying homes through email exchanges. So areas that people are looking to, to hack, to spoof and, and really get you in trouble. Um, and then of course, the last one we'll note, and this is perhaps the most prevalent in our, in our daily lives or internet lives, social media. Um, social media not only can lead to privacy concerns, to, to cyber threats, but can also lead to physical threats. Um, we'll talk about that later, but you know, if, if you announce you're going on vacation to the whole world and your social media is on, set to public, people know that they can go rob your home or at least that's the best time to go do it. So it's stuff we all have to be cognizant of, but you're, you're, I, the, the goal here is to make sure people are a little bit scared of what's going on, but then give you solutions to how to fix it. So let's start to, to delve a little bit deeper. Um, so, the most common attacks that, that you're seeing nowadays, and some are getting more complex, but most common are ransomware and cyber extortion. So if you saw the name of our, of our webinar today, we're talking about, it, it's not just pipelines. So we have the Colonial Pipeline. Either you've heard about that in the news or you've felt it at the gas pump if you live in the Northeast or parts of the Northeast. There, a massive pipeline gets hacked and it impacts our entire lives and it's held for ransom and 4.5 to $5 million gets paid out. Um, CNA insurance in my industry, a cyber insurance provider gets held for ransom for a couple of weeks and pays out about $40 million to, to hackers. And this can happen to us as well as individuals. Um, and, and we'll get into how people can do that to you. Um, and at phishing and social engineering, so we talked before about emails and, and Will mentioned that the individual at work, the employees, they are the ones who are really the first defense. You can have all the best cybersecurity in the world, but if the employee is not aware of how to spot things like phishing and vishing and social engineering, that doesn't really matter if the systems are secure because you're gonna let people in through the back door essentially. And you know, Will, maybe you wanna opine on that. Yeah, uh, well, and, and just the cyber extortion, uh, one of the funny stories, and I would not name any names, but I, I get a phone call from an individual uh, here in Atlanta, and they're like, hey, Will, can I talk to you offline? And wasn't a client, but it was, uh, um, it was like, 
I got an email saying that they've been recording me and they've got the information they don't and I'm gonna they're gonna tell my wife um, and and just going on and on about what he's been doing on his computer and what he's been looking at and um, and so they you know demanded a so, so much uh, uh, sort of extortion uh, for them not to tell his wife and <laughs> he says will what do I do I'm like one that's a fake email don't you know and two what are you doing that they don't want you don't want your wife to know <laughs> but uh you know so just be very careful um uh, especially personal if you're sitting there doing god knows what on your personal devices or even your business devices remember you have a camera that on a lot of laptops today that camera's on um i can hack into a, a laptop put some code in there and all and turn your camera on listen to you and watch you while you're sitting in front of your machine so you got to be very careful. And that's what you see a lot of people, uh, some of these little gadgets where you can put over and, and slide it to close the camera off when you're not using the camera. Yeah. Encourage. Um, and, and so especially with your kids being in the house, especially if you got teenage boys, you never know what they're looking at or what they're doing unless you're properly locking them down. But when you definitely take, and we see a lot of this, is, uh, you know, companies will, you know, their, their laptop, the, the company thinks it's secure, the employee takes it home, the teenage teenager is doing whatever, gets a virus that spreads across their home network, and now that employee takes that um, um, virus-ridden laptop back to the company, which spreads across the company. It can happen, and it does happen. So, yes, but but phishing, I mean, we one of the things that we do for our clients is we'll send out phishing emails, uh, test phishing, uh, mm -hmm. Amex. It looks like Amex. Uh, how many people get you know your mx password needs to be reset and we get so many people clicking on it and actually filling out their username and password to this fake account just yeah. because they got an email and it's not just mx it's linkedin it's all kinds of things that we can send to trigger your employees to click on something and it's very scary that good thing they're clicking on something that's innocent but if there's actually a virus or something that they're trying to capture your true mx information that could hurt your company a lot Absolutely. And, and Will, I have an actual anecdote that a friend told me a couple of weeks ago. They had hired a new employee and it's, it's a big lighting company in New York City, big contractor. And she had just gone through the cybersecurity training. So don't do this in an email, make sure you call, et cetera, et cetera, before for exchanging money. And so she gets an email from the CEO, quote unquote, and we'll get oh, yeah. into how you can spot that. And she, he says, okay, we, we want to give gifts to a, to a great client. So go out and buy $2,000 worth of gift cards. Girl, she, she goes out and does it. And all of course, she, 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 she doesn't know the CEO doesn't have it. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you're not going to pick up the phone and say, Mr. CEO, did you, did you just tell me to do this? Or you, you'd think they're going to yell at you. Of course, I just sent you the email. Uh, now, of course, you should pick up the phone if something odd like that happens. But anyway, she didn't know. So I don't know if she's going, it actually happened. I don't know if she's going to get paid out for it because they said you were just trained on it. Um, but, you know, guys, this same thing happens. And, and we'll, I have an example of an email that you can see how to spot if something is spam email, if something has been spoofed, which is much more difficult to deal with than a spam email. Um, and, and even spam's getting more sophisticated. Now, something that's a little more touching and, and harder to talk about for most is is cyberbullying as a common threat for cyber. Um, now there's cyberbullying where someone's child's bullying someone else. That's a different problem. That's like getting to legal liability. But imagine your kids getting bullied online. You know, years ago, if you were getting bullied as a young kid, you were going to get, you know, people were gonna be mean to you at school, but then you could go home and have some sense of security. Nowadays, that doesn't exist because most bullying happens online. Mean kids are smart, you know, they're smart enough to not do this all in public. And so you go home, you're in your room and you're on social media. There's no escape from some of this. And, and it can lead to children having to, to change schools. Um, tragically, there have been suicides due to this. So these are, you know, this gets into the whole social media side of cybersecurity. And it's, you know, it's something to be very cognizant of. And often you have to work with schools to make sure that, that kids are aware of what's going on, how to avoid it. Um, and then lastly, malware and viruses, malware meaning malicious software. These have been here since computers existed. They will be here you know, for as long as computers exist in any format. Um, we can have great antivirus software, but again, you click a bad link, you do certain things wrong. And also some computer systems aren't as 
great at protecting against viruses as others. And that's often why you have to work with, with groups like Wills to make sure that you have uh, systems in place beyond just what the computer comes with that you're using. And something, Hayden, I want to add to that is I, I just having this conversation today with a prospect that we met with and, you know, talking about they have antivirus on their machines. And, you know, why would I be able to get hit with a ransomware? Well, the, the antivirus companies, they write what's called a definition or a rule uh, that says, OK, I'm going to block this particular virus. That's a known virus. The problem with ransomware, even though that ransomware is known, the algorithm is always changing. So it could be the same virus, um, but the algorithm changes. So the, uh, the antivirus companies are not able to write a rule uh, or a definition to block that. So that's why ransomware can get past the virus protection that you have if you, all you're doing is antivirus. That's why we really preach a multi-layers of security. And just for your, just like, you know, for your home as well and your family, two-factor authentication, you're already doing it with your banks. Um, they require it to log into their system. Two-factor is I know something, I have something, I know my password and I have my phone um, that's gonna send a, um, a text message with a code. Um, you know, and I would encourage you that I do it on my Facebook LinkedIn account. I have two factor authentication on everything I do because you, you, it's easily to hack these things. It, it is. It's extremely easy. And I think originally when two factor came along, people said, well, I don't want to have an extra step. It's really not painful. Now you sign up for it. I, this happens to me all the time. I sign into an Amazon account from a new device. I get a text to my cell phone. It says, Hey, did you actually sign in? I say, yes, gives you a code. Um, it's very easy to use, like like Will said. You're, if your bank's using it, it's probably smart to use it. Those guys are really top notch and have to be for various reasons when it comes to security. So, moving on. Uh, just a second, we're loading here. Okay, so getting into a little bit more on cyber extortion ransomware. I know we just went went over this a bit, but. I want to work off the assumption that not everyone listening is aware of really what this is. So it is a, it's basically a modern form of, of ransom, but instead of kidnapping a person, you're taking control of someone's computer system or a company's computer system um, and threatening them. So the way it usually happens is you would go, you go to open your laptop, you go to fire up your desktop monitor, and all of a sudden across your whole screen, it says, we have taken control of your data there's going to be a timer that says you have X amount of time to pay us off X amount in Bitcoin or, or Ether. It's usually, or I think almost always in my experience, a cryptocurrency that they're asking for. And they'll say, look, if you pay us back, we're going to give access back to your data. And that could be a whole company's data, or that could be your individual or family data online, which is really important. Um, and the, the, there's the old saying, there's honor among thieves or <laughs> or that there's no honor among thieves. In this case, there really is honor among thieves. Almost always, once you pay it off, as you saw with the colonial pipeline example, uh, they're going to give access back to your data. And in a sense, that's kept this going. It's, it's made this a big problem. And now there's terror funding confusion as to whether you can pay off certain entities. Uh, so there's that, that's coming down the pike as to if there's going to be legal aspects of that. Uh, but, you know, Will, maybe you want to jump in and... and give your side of where you're seeing that going. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, and they're not, they're, they're thieves, uh, just, uh, you know, but a little different than someone breaking into your house, right? Um, they do have a honor code um, because they know if they do not return your data, they're not going to get paid. Um, and, if, and well, and if, well, they're, they're going to get paid, but they won't continue getting paid from other people. There is actually a place where you could go and rate and people can rate the hackers that hack you with the different viruses on what's the percentage of, uh, of rate of them returning the data. So they get a grade. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, you know, so if someone comes to us and says, hey, we've got ransomware, we've been attacked. One of the first things we're going to do is go to the FBI website and see if there's a decryption key already for that particular virus. The next thing we're going to do is look at the particular hacker or the virus to find out what's the return rate on that. A lot of them have chat where you can actually talk to the hacker directly and 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 try to negotiate. I will tell you, it does not happen 99% of the time. Actually, it's only happened to us once. And the reason the, the particular um, customer that came to us, they were hacked twice by the same hacker. hacker. 
Um, it was two different encryption keys. One was $40,000, one was $20,000. They did give us a nice discount of $5,000 on the second $20,000 after we paid the $40,000 um, of $5,000 since it was the same client. Um, but that's very seldom. Um, the average you know, hack right now for ransomware is about $44,000, $45,000 um, uh, that you get hit with. That's the minimum. Um, but obviously, depending on how big you are as a company and how much data that they can find, they're going to charge you more. So don't think, you know, you're not going to get by with the days of $300 or $600. That's long gone years ago. Yeah, that's, you know, I remember when I started doing this, it was, you know, four figures, five figures. Now you're seeing, I mentioned that CNA ransomware that you're getting into eight figures and, and heavily into the eight figures. It's, it's pretty ugly. Um, and even if it's yourself as an individual, if you don't have insurance on this, you're going to be paying out of pocket. You, know, you want to pay a, a half a Bitcoin nowadays? You're talking $25,000. I mean, this is no joke. So, so these numbers are, are going up heavily. Um, again, they're asking for money in cryptocurrencies. Why? Because it's really hard to trace. If you send cash payments, you could mark the bills, you could figure out where they went, and people can't use US dollars in the places that these people are conducting the hacks from. And we'll get into who's conducting some of this too. Uh, but that's, that's the gist of cyber, of, of cyber extortion. Um, now, data restoration. So one of the costs associated with malware and viruses is data restoration. And, you know, on, on the company side, the data there is obvious. But I want you to think for a second about your personal data and especially things you really treasure. Uh, you know, growing up, you know, if, if you're you know, around 30 or older, you had family photos all at home. They were all physical copies. We all remember going to get your photos processed and so forth and buying digital cameras. Uh, and so a lot of folks, you know, I go and visit my family. My mother still has all these pictures and chests and we look over them uh, around, around the holidays. Uh, but nowadays, if you're a young family, for example, I, I'd estimate that almost all of your photos of you and your children and your spouse are stored online. So imagine if you're if you lose access to all of those, it's a really it's almost like your house burnt down in the sense of you you just lose this stuff completely. Um, so one of the insurance aspects of it is our data restoration costs. You know, Will, I'm sure you could speak to some of the pains of trying to restore data, especially when people didn't reach out to you first or reach out to an expert first, which is always an ugly situation. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, especially at home, people think about, oh, I don't, I, you know, I don't back up to the cloud. Um, I just back up on a USB drive. But the problem with, uh, you know, ransomware, if you plug that USB drive in, that virus spreads to that. So it's going to encrypt the laptop and or the desktop and that USB drive. Um, so we find so many cases of that. Um, and, and we have a lot of our employees of our clients come to us and say, hey, I got hit um, or someone's died and everything is in the, this computer and the computer is encrypted so can you guys get into it so you no one's thinking about you know you think about well if something happens to me i need to have a living will or a will to say what's going to happen to my kids what's going to happen to my money but no one thinks about having something in place of how does the person get into my locked laptop encrypted or password protected laptop um upon my death because yeah. there's so much stored there. So that's some of the things to definitely think about. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Will, because if you think now about digital currencies, and I'm not gonna opine one way or another on those, but let's say you had a lot of money invested in those and you don't give anyone your password. No one's just gonna provide that information over. A lot of this stuff is not so sophisticated. Um, and that's just one example. Then you have all your social media platforms and all this stuff. And you know, it's, it's uh, the, the I, I refer to it as the digital extension of self we, we have this online persona, we have this online data, and yeah, maybe it can't get wrecked in a fire or if a pipe bursts like most of your belongings, but it, 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 those are your belongings, that is your property. You really have to, to try and consider it as such and, and of course plan for that in the event of something unfortunate happening. Yep. Um, so now this is, this is a fun segment. So signs of spotting fraud. So we all know fraud can happen. We all know we get spam email. Uh, but, but how do you spot signs, maybe either because you're on the edge and not sure if an email or, or information is legit, or because you just want to be safe before maybe transacting a deal? Uh, so first of all, not all cyber fraud is easily detectable. 
it used to be, you know, there, there's the famous Nigerian prince emails that go out. Those are very well known. And, you know, it says, I'm a prince from Nigeria. I, I need you to invest in me. And yeah, I have a big business. And I'll come to America. And, you know, they expect you to send money. Um, most of these events are, are becoming much more sophisticated. They're written in perfect English. They're using the logos of legitimate companies. Sometimes it's not a company that you work with, so you can, <laughs> that's, that's a sure sign that there's something wrong. Uh, but I wanna talk about the example of, this will apply to spam and then also email spoofing, which is something that's being done very frequently now to steal money at the very tail end of, of especially high dollar transactions, like purchases of items. Um, so what are the ways that you can notice perhaps that an email is not legitimate? Um, well, if you look at this email that we have in the webinar, you see the Amazon.com logo at the top. That looks pretty legitimate. You know, you, that wouldn't raise eyebrows. Um, it says it's coming from Amazon. Well, you know, and so you figure that's legitimate. You see a link in the email and it's Amazon.com slash exec. Okay, well, that seems legit. Now, one of the beauties of modern, uh, modern email clients is that you can hover over links and see what you're going to before you click it. So for example, in this, in this image, if you hover over the link, it looks like it's from Amazon. Then it goes to redirect to caresskedja.com. And you know, you're probably ending up on some Eastern European website. So that's, you, that, that's certainly a sign that there's something off. Um, another thing that you can notice is if you're having correspondences and they're personalized, then all of a sudden it says something like dear client or dear friend or dear individual. That may be something that rings some bells and you say, this guy was just calling me Hayden. Why is he now calling me dear client, especially before we've closed a deal perhaps? Um, so that can make you susceptible. Um, of course, something you can look out for, this is harder to notice, but sometimes in spam emails or spoofed emails, if they're being done from Eastern Europeans, they use the Cyrillic alphabet. So the lowercase a is essentially the same as us, but has slight curvature on the lower part of the a. So you can actually, if you really look close on spam emails from there, sometimes they forget to change their alphabet on the A and it's the Cyrillic A for certain words. And you say, oh, that's weird. That's hard to notice. That's more of like an expert thing to figure out. But something that is very important and can really, really help is when you see the from section of an email, it doesn't matter what it says, who it's coming from. I could get an email from Will and I'll say, hey, Will emailed me. But if something's funky in the email, if I hover over, that from area, it may turn out that it's from some totally made up email. It's not from Will, it's not from Vector Choice, because you can create an email. This is what they call spoofing. So what can happen is, as I mentioned earlier with that CEO at the lighting company, you know, new employees see something that comes from the CEO. Now, if she were to hover over that email, she would be able to see that, well, you know, it wasn't coming from the CEO, it was coming from someone made up. And, you know, Will, if you want to jump in, you've probably seen a million examples of things like this that have led to trouble for your clients. This happens more and more and every day, all day long. Um, and, and, and because they know the user is the weak link when it comes to cybersecurity and clicking on things, um, you know, it, it, even on the personal side, the shopping, especially during the holidays, you get all these deals from, um, you know, Macy's and other um, other stores about specials they're running. I would encourage not even clicking on the links, go to the Macy's website or go to that uh, um, the retailer's website and click on the link. All the deals that they're going to have is going to be there as well. Just stay away. I mean, yeah, maybe it triggers you to to go to their website, to look at it and then and, and buy cheaper for a special deal. But don't click on those links because it's really hard to determine even there, if it's coming from a legit place or not. Um, you know, one of the big things that's going around now is that I was just talking to a banker Saturday at my daughter's uh, tournament, and he's having uh, where his client um, paid a wire transfer for a, to a caterer. Well, the bank didn't get hacked. His client didn't get hacked. The caterer got hacked, took the the communication out of the person's email, took the invoice, re changed the invoice with a different uh, a wiring information, sent it to the uh, the customer or the, to his customer. The customer forwarded to the bank to send the wire for him. And of course, now they're back. They were back and forth. The bank is your fault that, you know, no, it's your fault. And when they and when they did the forensics, it ended up being that the caterer was the one that was hacked. Um, and so you 
it, that gets very, very complex and complicated. So you got to you got to be careful of just willy dilly paying invoices that you're not not familiar with, and asking questions, picking up the phone and calling, and going back to the old days of a phone call. I know no one likes doing that anymore. Everybody uh, wants to uh, do email communication, but sometimes you have to check on that. Absolutely, and and look if if. I think some of the hesitance sometimes on, on picking up the phone is you don't want to insult someone and ask if it's legitimate. The easiest way to go about doing that, and this can be for a business deal or this could be in your individual life buying something, is call and say, hey, I just want to make sure I got the wiring instructions correct in the email and, and read it out to them. Because what they may say is, we didn't send wiring instructions, which is a sure sign that, that you're going to avoid fraud. Or And there are times also where someone has a typo in the wiring instructions and that can lead to an issue. And, and look, I think some people also get settled into figuring, well, you know, my bank's obligated to, to make sure these are legit transactions. They don't always catch them. Your money might be in Hong Kong before you realize that, that you've been had. So, so don't be afraid to pick up the phone. There are very many ways to do it politely without, you know, sort of accusing someone of maybe being, <laughs> maybe being spoofed, but, but everyone seems to understand that this is now a threat. So I think, I, I think the, the bar to, to doing that is probably a bit lower and people shouldn't be so worried. And, and, to, and, this, is, and this is happening a lot as well with closing attorneys and mortgage, and mortgage yeah. companies um, and, and title companies. Uh, uh, you know, if you're re refinancing your house or buying a new house, definitely pick up the phone to talk to the closing attorney before you really dilly just wire something because that is uh, very hot right now as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Those, and then, you know, I mentioned earlier art transactions. There are examples of really legitimate art dealers their emails get hacked. And then by the time a transaction is about to go down, someone spoofs the email of the dealer. The buyer is told, hey, wire money to XYZ account. They send millions of dollars, millions of euros, depending where that's happening. And weeks later, they say, hey, we never got the painting. And they say, well, yeah, well, you never sent the money. And so you have these really ugly scenarios. And, and like Will said, closing agents are a big example of folks who are being targeted. Um, it happens to auto dealers, any of these big dollar transactions. They're not so focused, not to say you can't get, get defrauded on a small transaction, but there's more money in, in it for the, for the criminal to get involved in these high dollar transactions. Yep. Uh, so now this is, this is also interesting. So I think all of you are invaluable watching this, but the internet does not believe your personal data and privacy to be invaluable. So I'm not gonna read this whole page, but I wanted some of the info up so you can get an idea of what is your information worth on the dark web as, as we call it? What is your information worth to criminals online? I think the big number is that for if you're a US citizen, your fulls as they call it, full credentials, they average about $8 per record. So you know somebody could get your social security on it, alone for a single dollar on the dark web. This stuff, this information is so plentiful online that it's it's at the point of superfluity where you can get anyone's information. It's like, you know, you can pick a famous person. You could find that online probably. Um, and now it, it, you may say, well, you know, people could only do so much with my info. That's true. But they if they have your social and they have some of your info, they could file a tax return in your name. That happens very frequently around tax season. So there's a lot they can do with it. And then you also have the idea of, of credit cards. So you have credit card info when a Target gets hit with a hack, when a Yahoo gets hit with a hack. So much of our info ends up just being sold for bulk or just being dumped for bulk onto the dark web. Um, so you may think, well, you know, I'm being secure and that's great, but the companies with whom you do business or to whom you give your data, when they get hacked, that leads to our information going out and that can lead to damage. So, you know, Will, I'm sure you can speak to how that's impacted if your clients are or prior to becoming a client have been hacked and what they've had to do about that. Yeah, the unfortunate thing, a lot of people think, oh, my, you know, yeah, my data is on the dark web. I can't do nothing about it. Yeah, you can't do anything about your data being on the dark web um, after the fact. But you could definitely take precautions like your passwords, you know, not storing your passwords. And this is for business and residential. Don't use a, a Google Chrome and where it says, do you, you want to save your password? And, and Internet Explorer or Firefox where it automatically saves your password because it saves it in plain text. So, uh, you know, you don't even have to be a hacker. You just be someone that can do IT and get into the file and then get all and get all your passwords in plain text at that point. Um, you just got to be uh, be very careful how you send your information. 
Um, make sure it's encrypted. If you're sending your social security information or any passwords or credit card information, make sure it either verbally say it to someone, pick up the phone and call it, but just don't take a picture of your credit card and send it via email because now it's stored in your email and it's stored in the other person's email. And if you're using a Gmail or Yahoo or something like that, again, very easily to hack. Uh, and they're looking for that type of information. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to, to speak to as far as passwords go, there are a lot of products out there now that will auto generate passwords. And that's great from a security standpoint, but can be tricky if you don't remember them and you don't have them on all your devices. But I would say at a minimum, at some point, if you have social media accounts, if you buy stuff online from any big retailers, you probably had your information involved in a hack. So at the very least, it's really important to update your passwords. I know folks, I've got probably 30 different passwords. It's not fun to do it, um, but it's important to update at least passwords on, on apps and with companies that you're transacting deals with. So maybe your bank and, and groups like that. They have great security systems, but it doesn't mean that people can't get onto your end and take money before their security system knows it. Um, so there, there's, there's, that's one of, the, one of the easiest ways to avoid financial problems is updating your passwords. But you, know, it's, it, but you also don't want to update them and then write your password down in somewhere in plain sight. Because I can't tell you, know, I've worked in big commercial offices before. I, I could get on, if I was a, an ethical hacker or wanted to play a prank on someone, I could get onto pretty much anyone's system because you open the first drawer or you have a sticky note hanging from a monitor and it's, it says, hey, you know, my password is work for company, love to work, whatever these funny <laughs> little things are. And it's, it's incredibly easy to get on. So, you know, it's, uh, don't, don't write it down somewhere obvious and do change them as, you know, you know 90 days is usually reasonable, but you know, be smart about it. And I rather, and, and I hate to say this, but I rather you write it down at your home than put it in an Excel spreadsheet on your computer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, do just just when he says don't write it down, still do not put it on an Excel spreadsheet. Use some kind of bat password database. Uh, I think for a consumer, I believe LastPass is free. I believe um, it does call for the company or enterprise level. Um, but do something that is a password database vault uh, to put your passwords in besides just leaving it out there to the world to see. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and then also... When it comes to passwords, you know, also you want to write down the information, like where were you born, stuff like that. You want to remember the information you gave it, because if you just happen to forget your password or if someone wants to try and break on, you know what I do, you know, and don't be afraid to, to lie to the system. If, if everyone knows that you were born in a certain place, because it says it right on your Facebook account, when it says, where were you born, make up a city somewhere you know, as, as the, the password reset information. No one's going to be able to guess that you were born in, in somewhere in Morocco if you were born in New Jersey. So for, you know, I'm not saying I use, <laughs> I don't use Marrakesh or anything, but you know, that, that's an example. So, so you're, you're not violating any uh, moral code by lying to the computer. You're, you're better protecting yourself. It's a nice little workaround. Uh, now, who conducts cyber attacks? This answer could be much broader, but I wanted to focus on some of the main groups and, and so you get an idea. This isn't necessarily important to you protecting yourself, but it is really important to you understanding why this is being done, which I think is, is useful information. And so the, the first big one, who conducts cyber attacks? And I'm, I'm talking about both ethical and criminal cyber attacks. So there are state actors involved. Uh, for example, if you ever hear about an Iranian nuclear facility going down, the Israeli IDF very rarely will say we didn't do it. They'll kind of smile and say, yeah, maybe it was us. Um, and then there are state actors who are doing things that are you know, intended to try and take down power grids and so forth. So, so those, are, those are, can be done in different ways. Um, and then you know, there are lone wolf hackers. There, there are kids and, and you know, their proverbial kid in their parents' house, a teenager. And they're breaking onto major systems. You had uh, the Gucci for hacks of, of many major public individuals and diplomats, where you know there there may have been some more to the story, but the, from a lot of what we know, is just this Romanian guy who was crudely hacking on to to major systems and then just dumping the information out. So there are lone wolf or possibly lone wolf incidents, and then there are criminal syndicates. So criminal syndicates 
in theory are, are private groups, but the countries that they often form, for example, in Russia, you're not doing much in Russia without an oligarch or without the government approving of it or knowing of it. So these are useful to state actors because it allows them to conduct attacks and, and conduct intelligence operations without their name actually being attached to it. They, they sort of have an arm's length distance. They can say, it wasn't us. We didn't know about this. And maybe it was in our country, but but it's it's very useful to them. And you know, Will, I'll, I'll, you could jump in here and, and speak to probably all three of, of how these impact your clients. Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing is that state uh, actors are not going to go after the average company. Okay, yeah. um, they're definitely going. It's the lone wolf hackers um, that that you have to worry about as a small business owner uh, in a small business, and even and and as well as a family or or your home. Um, those are the biggest ones. I mean, we see all kinds of, you know, uh, hacks. I mean, I, I've seen where uh, um, we got a hack from China, but it actually, uh, I, where it hacked uh, a, a, a company in a Georgia, which they were using their servers to hack a company in uh, Virginia. And the, the, the client in Virginia was our client. Well, we had to trace it back through the company and we even called the company in Georgia and said, hey, you guys have been hacked. Here's the information, gave it to their IT department, which they were a little freaked out that we had that much information on them. Uh, so, you know, the hackers are going to try to bounce off of other companies so you can't trace it back to them. And that's a state or, 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 or a lone wolf. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, look at, look at the catering incident where they, they spoof a caterer so they can get into other companies. You know, it's, these, I, I think that's the, the big takeaway, regardless of who is conducting these attacks. These are very sophisticated people. And you don't even have to be so technologically sophisticated now. So we spoke about ransomware before and how advanced that's getting. It's almost become a commercial enterprise. You can purchase what they call ransomware as a service. So you talk about cloud computing and software as a service. And nowadays we pay for Microsoft Word on monthly instead of buying the, the software and we access it a different way. People do the same thing with ransomware. So, you know, this is a very sophisticated marketplace and it's extremely, you know, it's, it, it's evolving extremely quickly. And that's again, why we have to be very conscious of what's going on because you know, just because we're not securing our stuff or, or consistently securing does not mean that hackers are not advancing as we're staying stagnant. Um, so now protection and prevention, a lot of this we have spoken about um, so far, but it's worth reiterating a few items. So I can't stress this enough. And, you know, from a, a personal and family perspective, Will can't stress this enough from a company perspective. If you're going to wire money, especially big dollar amounts, please get verbal confirmation that information is correct. Again, there are ways to ask for that without implying that someone may have been spoofed or anything or that that's what you're fishing for, uh, but, but very important. Check emails for the common signs of spam and spoofing. Again, just hover over who it's from. Do a quick check like, hey, do I even work with this company? Do I use Chase Bank? Why might they be emailing me? Um, one of the big ones, don't ever assume a phone call or an email is from the IRS. They do not call you. They do not email you. They will only send items to you from the mail. I don't care how threatening or how legitimate they sound. It's coming in the mail. If you're getting sued, it's in the mail. If they're asked, if they're giving you a tax return, it's either in the mail or sent digitally. Um, but it's not going to be in an email. It's not going to be over the phone. Uh, setting social media accounts to private. So. I, you know, Will and I are, are business people and public people in that regard. We've got public profiles on certain things. And that's, that's a conscious thing that you're doing. You know, we, we want people to see that information that's for marketing and business purposes. But in your private life, you may want your family and friends to see that you just took a vacation to the Caribbean. You don't need to let the world know that. Um, and, and not just you, but if you have kids, just because you're being secure online does not mean that your son or daughter didn't just send a picture to the whole world or post a story and tag their location so everyone knows you've left the home. People may know you're away for two weeks. You may say, hey, I'm in, your kid may say, hey, we're in Europe for two weeks. So, you know, we're going to have a great time. And someone criminal who's publicly viewing their information because it wasn't private is going to say, now's the time to go to the Johnson's house and start taking stuff. Um, so again, as I spoke about at the start of this, 
uh, cyber incidents leading to physical loss is is no joke and it's it's something that's only going to get worse as social media is more and more plentiful and people are extremely comfortable sharing information so worth worth being careful about um and then updating software promptly so i know it can be a pain when you and I'll, we'll 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 speak to this more than i'm about to but it, it can be a pain when your iphone when your laptop is saying look you've got to update your software we've got new patches we've bu got bug fixes that's not just, it's not them, you know, trying to slow down your phone. I know there were incidents about that with Apple. Um, it's because they notice that there are vulnerabilities in their network or that something's not working right and they need to fix it. And if you don't update, you remain vulnerable. So setting to automatic updates is good. Um, updating promptly can usually do it overnight. So it doesn't impact your day, um, but extremely important. Will, I'll, I'll let you jump in there. Yeah, and that's not just with phones, uh, not just computers, but your Internet of Things, your, your ring, uh, your uh, doorbells, your floodlight cameras, your, any cameras you have in your house, your, your refrigerator. Um, you know, it, it's just better if you don't have time to really focus on making sure those are updated, uh, do auto update. Um, you know, yeah, software companies are going to break things. Um, but here's the thing. I rather it break for a short time and they fix it. Uh, then you get hacked because you didn't update. Uh, um, that's what some of the biggest holes, and that's why they, you know, Microsoft is huge. The Microsoft product is full of holes, and they're constantly having to patch things, and that's why it's such a thing is called Microsoft Updates, um, is because you want to patch those holes so it stops the hackers from getting in. Yeah, and, and make the assumption that the hackers are aware of any hole there is. They're, they're going to know any vulnerability that's out there, um, and you don't want to be the one that they discover it on also. So, so sometimes you, people who don't update software, Microsoft may not know until months down the road that that old software version had an opening. You know, they, it may have been fixed without even realizing it was fixed, for example. That, that certainly happened. So update software promptly, hugely important. Um, and then finally, and we'll get into this in the next slide, purchase insurance when and where available. Um, so what insurance solutions are out there? It's, it's really in the last five to six years have insurance solutions started to exist and be available by most carriers. So uh, I'll break them down to three categories very quickly. So most carriers, I would say nowadays, especially the ones we work with, at the very least offer some form of coverage for identity theft. So resolution of identity theft, court, going to court to help yourself and you know, paying towards things like that are included. Um, and credit card theft coverage. So that could be financial loss. Usually those are combined. You often get your identity and your credit card stolen, unfortunately. Uh, maybe not every time, but that seems to happen a lot because people can buy your, your full credentials. So uh, these are usually really affordable coverages. A lot of reputable carriers offer them. Um, even groups like Allstate, uh, not that we work with them, but they're starting to acknowledge the digital and data protection side of insurance. So this is only going to expand um, it's new, so not every carrier offers the same thing. So, you know, if you if you speak to your agent or want us to review your insurance, depending on who you're with, we're going to have different answers as to what you can do. Um, and then some of the more advanced, the more robust insurance options, you will have coverage to pay out ransomware events. You will have coverage to pay towards data restoration if you are hit with malware or a different form of virus. You're going to have coverage to pay for your child. Um, to maybe get a psychiatric evaluation, to maybe change schools if they're experiencing a bad incident of cyberbullying. Um, and you also have crisis management endorse, uh, endorsements that you can add on. So those are examples like, let's say you're a prominent individual, a celebrity, uh, a business person, a local politician, for example, anyone who's somewhat prominent, if you get hacked and your information gets out there, maybe private emails, and so forth, you're gonna have a big PR fallout. So certain individuals are able to purchase this coverage and it will pay towards the PR expenses and, and damage control. Of course, you never want that to happen, but you also don't wanna pay for it if it does happen. That's not fun, let the carrier pay for that. Um, and then finally, I think this one is, is perhaps the most important and, and depends which carrier with how they're gonna offer it and, and how much coverage they'll offer. Uh, but funds transfer fraud coverage. This is for electronic transfer. Um, some coverage is included for, for check fraud, for example, for embezzlement and forgery. Uh, so there, there are some broad coverages. Sometimes you can get up to $100,000 in coverage for this, uh, if not more. You know, so as long as you're not conducting uh, 
in, as long as you're not wiring money over $100,000, which I assume most of us would not be doing, you're, you can have some pretty substantial coverage there. And, and again, not every carrier offers this in the same way or uses the same coverage language, but it's it now that this is available, it's, it's worth seeing if you can add it. We are all exposed. Um, and again, it does not usually cost an arm and a leg to, to purchase it because it is newer. Um, yeah. That's... Yeah. So, Hayden, we, we've got about three more minutes before our time's up, but I, I guess a question maybe a lot of people are thinking is, is, is this type of coverage for individuals affordable? Um, and I know you can't give me numbers right now, but is it affordable for the average uh, person? Should the average uh, person have this type of insurance if they have kids uh, or, or not? Um, and, and, and maybe a, a scenario or two of when this type of insurance would be used. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So to answer the first part, if you're getting basic ID theft and credit card coverage for your carrier, you could be you know, costing a couple dollars a month over the policy term. So extremely affordable. Um, you get into the cyber extortion data restoration, you could, you're getting into the hundreds, even into the thousands if you're really buying a lot, but you only buy as much as you need. And then funds transfer fraud, you know, you could be talking 100 to 200 a year, maybe. It's it's depending how much your deductible is if you have one. So we're not, you know, you, you buy as much as you need. Some of the coverage you don't need. Like, you know, you, you're, most people aren't going to have to worry about crisis management and PR expenses. So don't worry about that. But a lot of us may conduct transactions online or it may not be often, but, you, you know, if you do it enough, you, you want to look into funds, funds transfer fraud coverage. And we, we can all be victims of ID theft and credit card theft. So I think that that coverage at a bare minimum is really um, a no-brainer, and and you know, as far as examples go, well, uh, for for cyber extortion, you, know, you could open up your personal laptop, and maybe you clicked a bad website the day before, maybe you clicked a bad email, and all of a sudden your screen's locked. You know, we told you what it's going to look like, and if it's your individual laptop, your company's not going to pay for it because it's not their business what you do on your laptop. Um, so you're going to pay that out of pocket, and do you want to be paying ten to $50,000, depending on who's trying to hack you um, and figure out how to buy Bitcoin and all that, you know, good luck. It's not going to, it's not going to go smoothly. Yep, absolutely. So I want to, if any questions, please put that in the chat or Q&A um, for that. If, uh, with, if you view this webinar today, you, uh, you can get a free complimentary insurance con uh, consult uh, with Hayden. Um, you could take and just reach out to me um, and uh, here is my email address and phone number and everything. Reach out to me. I'll get you in contact with Hayden. He will look at, I, I believe Hayden, you can look on the personal side and the business side if you would right. like. Um, and look at both and see what kind of coverage you have and what you need. I would encourage you some of the things I have seen going through insurance uh, talks with insurance carriers. It's just the little things like, ooh, I didn't know I didn't have that. Um, you know, just had a, a and, and, and going back to this particular client, this caterer, um, the caterer said, well, you didn't uh, tell me I need cyber insurance uh, to the carrier. And the carrier came back and said, hey, here's where you denied cy cybersecurity yeah. insurance. So uh, that is bad. Um, so make sure you pay attention to what you're signing, especially with the carriers. Uh, and that when, when you say you're denying something, you clearly understand what you're waiving your rights to. Totally. So. Everyone, thank you so much for being on today. Hayden, thank you so much for uh, the presentation and helping us understand on the residential and consumer side of the things that um, I wasn't even aware of, that there was such a thing as cyberbullying insurance uh, um, and uh, or PR-related insurance. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, if, again, if anybody wants to reach out, please reach out to me and I'll get you over to Hayden. Again, thank you so much. Hayden, thank you. And thank Thanks so much for joining. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye.